Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to Sugar Ray on Kubernetes. Shut the door, baby. I'm Cynthia. This is Greg and we're from the GKE security team. We're actually gonna shift the security lens a little bit and actually focus on this up and coming framework, uh, Ray, open source platform. Uh, we actually took a little fun lyric here from an old uh, 90s band, Sugar Ray, does anyone? Sugar Ray fans? Yeah, okay, you guys are We, we came really close to singing it, uh, yeah, but we're sparing you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the mics aren't tuned for that, so. <laughs> uh, so what is Ray? If you're not familiar, uh, well, this is 2024, so we have to mention AIML. It's become increasingly pop popular amongst data scientists and ML practitioners who are deploying AIML workloads um, on, uh, at scale. It's been particularly popular for training, but there's other libraries as well, uh, like RayServe. So why is it so easy for data scientists to get going with this platform? Uh, let's take an example. I'm a data scientist, I'm writing some code locally on my laptop or my machine. Here's an example of uh, Python code, just a simple example, retrieving IP addressing on a host. In the ML world, you might be doing this iteratively many times, and then when it's time to move to a distributed platform to deploy at scale, Ray makes it really easy to get going. All you have to do is add this Ray decorator to the code, and voila, you're deploying on the Ray cluster. Uh, there's even also functions like Ray get to take advantage of the built-in distributed object store. Uh, so notice there's no notion of packaging and, and creating a container to get going. Uh, if we look at the Ray architecture a little bit more closely, we some, see some similarities from our Kubernetes world, so even the language, right, like Ray cluster, Raylet's doing similar uh, functionality to what we know. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's no notion of the containers or pods uh, as a unit of deployment. We see these worker processes that can be deployed, like those, those code functions we saw earlier. And we also notice a difference with the control plane separation. You actually can run worker processes on the, on the head node here. So how are we seeing Ray in the wild? Well, it is an open source platform, uh, so there's open source tooling. You can run the Ray cluster launcher on cloud providers like Google Cloud and AWS VMs. You can use KubeRay to deploy on Kubernetes. And then there's other methods to increasingly get help. So you can run the Marketplace app, run Ray on GKE. You could use the managed solution from any scale, the company behind Ray, or run Ray on, on Google Vertex AI. So why run Ray on Kubernetes? Well, we're a Kubernetes crowd, we know. We get some of the flexibility of running those mixed workloads, ML and non-ML together. We get scalability with node auto provisioning, manageability, the self-healing properties, uh, as well as operational efficiencies, running these things together. But of course, we're a security crowd, so let's talk about security. Uh, next, I'll hand it over to Greg to dive into what we're gonna focus on. Cool, so I think about two buckets here when I think about AIML security. We've got this infrastructure security stuff, which we're talking about in this talk, and that's your, how you configure, configure your compute, your storage networking. Uh, and then there's a, a different bucket we're not covering today that is the sort of new attacks and, and, and new things we're seeing, AIML security, so that's where your prompt injection and your uh, fancy ways to steal models uh, uh, using inference queries exist. But we're focusing on the infrastructure security today. And so if we look at Ray and think about their approach to security and, and sort of how the cluster operates, the Ray thinks about the compute uh, and this cluster is kind of just a big giant shared process that, that uh, doesn't really have any security boundaries inside of it. And the security in isolation is really sort of an exercise for the person deploying the cluster outside. So you, the idea is you're, you need to add security in isolation around the outside of the Ray cluster. And so that leaves us with uh, a couple different challenges. The first is that there's no, uh, there's no system of authentication or authorization built into Ray, so you've got these unauthenticated APIs that are, that, are, that are pretty powerful, that can schedule jobs. You need to protect those somehow. And then the second one is uh, maybe a problem or maybe not a problem, sort of depending on how you're using the cluster. Uh, and that's the inside of that cluster, it's kind of this big uh, shared process. And so there's no subcluster boundaries in there. Everyone using the cluster has to trust everyone else using the cluster. And uh, so we have the Oligo folks at the conference here today. You might have seen their, their presentation. Uh, they did some great research. Uh, so 
I think the security crowd knows is when you have these unauthenticated APIs uh, and you have to do extra work to, con to make those th things safe, then those are probably going to end up on the internet at some point. And so that's, of course, exactly what happened. So the Oligo folks did uh, some internet scanning and found uh, these APIs, uh, these unauthenticated dashboard and jobs APIs exposed to the internet. Uh, and so the sort of standard way to protect these is you, you add a authentication proxy in, in sort of in front of the APIs and then you wrap it in, in firewall rules and make sure everything goes through, through the proxy. But that's obviously not happening sort of in all cases here. People are making mistakes. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, how Kubernetes authentication and authorization could help with this, uh, with this challenge. And then to talk about the, the subcluster boundaries, I thought the most interesting way would be to just start with an attack on Ray uh, and show what it looks like to do attack propagation inside that cluster and then show what it looks like inside of Kubernetes and so we can see the difference between the two. So here we've got our Ray cluster. We've got a compromised process in the middle here. So you can imagine an attacker has got some, some execution inside of this workload somehow. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways they can move around. So uh, there's a, a global shared object store that workers pickle stuff into and then unpickle on other uh, nodes. And so uh, the attacker can sort of pickle malicious objects into this store and then have a different node unpickle them and execute that code. Uh, there's a lot of APIs that just do scheduling and are all unauthenticated, so uh, you can just ask the, each node to schedule a job. You could go through the jobs API, the dashboard API. Um, because the identity space is really flat inside of the cluster, every node is sharing the same identity, then you've basically got the union of all of the uh, cloud resources that the whole cluster needs. Uh, so uh, you, you've got that, all, all of those cloud resources you have access to because they're all using the same identity. And if we now take the same attack and do it on Kubernetes and just to contrast things a little and show, show the differences. So we have the same workload uh, compromise here. Uh, the first thing you can do is access the cloud resources for that identity. So you've not got sort of like every uh, cloud resource for the entire cluster. You've just got the ones for that particular pod uh, that you have access to. You might have access to the control plane uh, depending on whether a service account was provisioned or not. Uh, and so. Uh, depending on the privileges of that service account, uh, you might be able to talk to the control plane or maybe not at all. Uh, and sort of, it's not too common to have uh, Kubernetes control plane privileges, like uh, uh, high privileges for, for regular workloads. Um, you could attack east-west into the other nodes here, so the other pod services that are listening on other nodes. If you've done a good job securing this cluster, then you might have network policy, you might have a service mesh like Istio or something like that that is doing authentication and authorization for those that would block those kind of attacks. And then if you do a bunch more work, uh, you can break out of the container. It's hard, it's not easy, uh, but it's certainly possible. Uh, if you break out of the container, then you've got access to the credentials on the, on the node. So you can use the kubelet certificate to talk to the control plane. You're still in a bit of a box though. So the node restriction admission, the node authorizer, both constrain what you can do with that kubelet credential. Uh, and so you don't have access to everything. You've got access to the stuff that the kubelet needs to, to run those workloads. And then similarly, you can get access to the other tokens that are for the other workloads running on that node. So TLDR here is like more boundaries, more separation uh, is in a, in a sort of like common operating model for Kubernetes compared to Ray inside the cluster. Doesn't matter. Um, I think it's fine if your tenancy model matches, if, if everyone knows that they're sharing this cluster and uh, that they're all at the same sort of security level and everyone trusts each other with each, uh, with each other's data, then that's fine. Um, I think the security, standard security recommendation, like looking at an architecture level like this would be, all right, let's just give everyone a cluster and that way we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry if they know that they're, they should, that they're trusting each other completely. Uh, and I think that's sort of reasonable. I, but unfortunately, the GPU and TPU economics are pushing you in the other direction. So these, these are really expensive things that are hard to get right now. Um, and so the, really the ideal scenario is uh, you spend a lot of money on GPUs and TPUs, and then you want all of the workloads to kind of share them to make sure those, those GPUs are utilized all the time. Uh, you can't have them sitting idle. And so the economics sort of pushes you in the other direction, which, is my, which might be how you end up sharing clusters that maybe shouldn't be sharing uh, each, with each other. So can Kubernetes help here? I'm going to uh, send it back to Cynthia to talk about how, how we might be able to help. All right, thanks, Greg. So yeah, let's talk about uh, some solutions to those challenges that uh, Greg just outlined. So 
how can Kubernetes help? Well, we can help secure those unauthenticated APIs uh, that Ray is presenting. So um, to, to start, you know, what Greg outlined and what Oligo has found and warned us against is don't put these on the public internet. Use private networks, private addressing, and private endpoints. Uh, how to expose uh, the Ray cluster? Well, we can take advantage of the built-in authentication and authorization that Kubernetes has. So you can expose as a Kube proxy service, leverage the Kube API server for that authentication and authorization. Uh, next, you can take it up a notch and put an identity proxy in front, and then you can have more fine-grained tooling on and access controls, leveraging things like parameters such as source IPs or regions or, or other uh, inputs that you could put in to control access. Uh, we, this is fast-moving space too. There's actually an open source uh, proposal for putting Kube Ray authentication natively uh, for Ray clusters. You can also use identity-aware proxies and limit it just to an organization. So we have some links here for more information on that. And then what about the solution to leveraging the same platform for the basically maximizing GPU and TPU type utilizations? So Kubernetes can help with the multi-tenancy aspects of security. Um, so you can put Ray clusters in uh, their own namespaces, and then you can take advantage of Kubernetes network policy uh, to control the traffic uh, in the Kubernetes cluster. You can leverage the resource quotas as to not starve resources uh, across the Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, and then as, as Greg outlined earlier, also the, the container boundary, just having more uh, boundaries that Kubernetes uh, natively has to help contain attacks as, as best possible. So there is somewhat of a trust level here across the cluster, uh, but we can help uh, with some of the constructs we know from Kubernetes to help contain that. And we also have a blog linked out here too on, on more uh, tidbits there. So how can Kubernetes help? Well, we can get access to those APIs in an authenticated and authorized manner. But as we saw, there's actually no new boundaries within the Ray cluster. Uh, so it's still enabling that kind of communication as long as that tenancy is understood. Uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, we do get these boundaries that Kubernetes gives us for uh, clusters on shared nodes. All right, I'll hand it back to Greg to close this out. So if we think a little bit about sort of beyond Ray and think more about AIML and, uh, and our cloud native ecosystem, I think the infrastructure security really is still critical for AIML. We've got a lot of new uh, and exciting attacks uh, that are AI specific, but we also have a lot of uh, regular infrastructure security that needs to underpin, underpin these, uh, these, new, uh, these new applications. Uh, and so as we saw here, like this is still super critical to get right uh, and is part of the picture. I think we're going to see tenancy play a big role in AIML security in the future. We talked about infrastructure tenancy here, which is just one layer. I think there's also going to be a lot of mistakes made in uh, tenancy inside of models, uh, tenancy with agents where the, the model is calling agents to do work. I think it's really easy to get those things wrong and have those share where they shouldn't be sharing. Uh, and it's not that obvious how to do it right. And so I think we're going to see, as, as we get more and more AIML applications built, we're going to see errors in this area and difficulty in this area. Uh, and I think just uh, with that cheery note, uh, <laughs> I think if we can look at these existing solutions that we have and, um, and uh, look at things that we know are already well hardened, that are already well integrated into our SSO uh, and our other sort of detection mechanisms, then that will definitely help us out. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, have a great day too. Enjoy the conference.